It is now time for the sponsor perspective session of the program. Jason Jedlitsky is general manager of The Hill, and he sat down this morning with Mike McDermott, the chief global supply officer and executive vice president of Pfizer. But first, a short video from Pfizer. For many industries, the future of manufacturing and distribution looks uncertain. But at Pfizer Global Supply, we see it differently. Amidst global crises, we're doubling down, pivoting, and innovating more than ever before. Laying new groundwork, expanding capabilities. Because sometimes the only way forward is through. To us, a supply chain revolution is the only response. Driving innovation in manufacturing and distribution to get medicines to the people who need them most. It's not easy, but we've always known what we're capable of. The resilience, flexibility, and talent of our people shines even brighter when the world goes dark. We're not on the other side yet, but we'll keep pushing until we get there. Because breakthroughs that change patients' lives can't wait. Joining us now is Mike McDermott, Chief Global Supply Officer for Pfizer. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here. Well, let's dive right into the theme of the program, reimagining the pharma supply chain. Why is that so critical? Look, if you think about supply chains on everybody's minds uh, these days in any industry, and it's no different in the pharmaceutical industry, you know, at Pfizer, our purpose is uh, breakthroughs that change uh, patients' lives. So our research has uh, changed over the years, 173 years uh, since we were founded. And of course, our manufacturing has uh, changed along the way. But then if you think particularly around this, the COVID pandemic, how we all really had to modify our ways of working. So I think this is such an important time to talk about this right now. And you mentioned the pandemic. Besides finding the vaccine and the development of the vaccine, tell me some of the ways that the supply chain uh, really impacted Pfizer's delivery of that solution. Yeah, so you think about the, the pandemic and sort of everybody was struggling, right? Supply chains were struggling, in some cases downright failing around the world. And the pharmaceutical industry, I think, was really there. It was really a proud moment for us to make this uh, impact on public health. And, you know, for Pfizer, if you think about when that started, it was uh, March of 2020 when we partnered with BioNTech to think, could we imagine a COVID vaccine that was not only safe and effective, but we could produce billions of doses? I mean, that was kind of the, the notion. Uh, and then could we do it at light speed? Could we do a process that takes up to 10 years to launch a vaccine? Could we do it in nine months? And then even more so, how could we make billions of doses, uh, which ultimately led to us doing a 15x uh, improvement in our pre-pandemic vaccine production to post-pandemic. Uh, so yeah, to say it was uh, an amazingly stressful but innovative time would be an understatement. Uh, but I think the impact has been great. Uh, the numbers today were 4 billion doses distributed to 181 countries around the world. And I think what's excitingly and most important is uh, equity has always been on our minds. So 1.6 billion of those doses went to 112 low and middle income countries. So it really was a global effort that impacted patients around the world. Were there some firsts for Pfizer in there, some things that you'd never done before? Yeah, there were definitely some firsts in there, which was uh, amazing. Uh, while we have a really uh, very deep technical platforms across uh, biologics and vaccines and small molecules, we had never launched the mRNA vaccine before. So that focus around how to scale up uh, mRNA in particular was a focus for us. And then while we have cold chain expertise, we've never done minus 80 cold chain at scale. And so that was uh, definitely new for us. It, it seems like a distant memory, and it was only three years ago That's that right. we were all talking about those shipments. That's right. Uh, what are some of the major lessons learned that you and the industry are taking away from, from this uh, experience? Yeah, so if I think about the lessons learned, uh, certainly for Pfizer and then the industry, for Pfizer, it's been really around our speed. I talked about a light speed culture. How can you really cut the bureaucracy and drive uh, uh, solutions and give colleagues a chance to just go, to just, uh, just take everything out of their way and just let them innovate and drive. Uh, I also think science, of course, we talked about mRNA technology and, and the partnership we have with BioNTech really made an impact there. Um, so there's a speed a scale. Uh, and the, the scale piece for me is what really uh, blew me away was our 37 uh, internal plants 30,000 colleagues, hundreds of contract manufacturers, and thousands of uh, individual companies came together to really make this, uh, this impact. 
So when I think about what that could mean for the industry, uh, for sure, those partnerships are going to be uh, key going forward. Uh, and then for sure, it's going to be important for us, uh, like here in the US, uh, to ensure that we have a favorable environment right, for our innovations. Uh, and in particular, right now, make, making sure that the uh, uh, Made in America Act is passed so that uh, our FDA can be funded to do their great work. If you think back to that moment when you had to disrupt all those operations and all those plants, it's, it's one of those, not can we, but how will we do it? Um, what, what's something that surprised you from that experience? Yeah, I think the most surprising thing was the ability to just innovate at, at speed. Uh, and actually, that constraints actually helped us, right? Because if we had no constraints, if there was no time factor to this, we could have been ideating this forever. Uh, but the fact that we had a public health crisis, the fact that we had a uh, really focus. Um, and then, of course, we had a wonderful CEO that said, you know, money's not going to be the issue and just, just work it out. Uh, I think that was really empowering to colleagues. And that's what kind of blew me away in the, in the whole experience. It's a bit like me growing up. You know, my dad uh, was in NASA. He worked on the Apollo program. And I always imagined what that was like for him. You know, I, I watched it as a kid, but for him as a professional. And I kind of always wondered would I have that experience in my life. And sure enough, launching the COVID vaccine was uh, definitely a bit like putting a human on the moon. That's a, that's a great full circle family story there. Indeed, yeah. As you think of pandemics yet to come, unfortunately, we know COVID-19 won't be the last. And we know the nature of um, you know, public health going forward. Um, what are some of the, the enduring lessons you think that are, that are going to be critical to follow in the future? Yeah, I think uh, for sure for Pfizer, what we really embraced during this uh, was, again, light speed culture. Uh, for sure, we embraced by way digital. I mean, the digital tools that we had to use and, and embrace during this process were really groundbreaking and made such an impact, uh, particularly in our cold chain technology, uh, really made an impact there. And I think the other piece that really like, inspired me during it was the focus on equity. Uh, I talked earlier about getting the vaccine to uh, patients. And we thought, well, how could we reimagine the supply chain? How could we get to that last mile in some places where to think of this cold chain, how could it possibly be? And so we ended up designing the cold chain, sol chain solution that could be minus 80 for 30 days without, without a plug anywhere, right? Just, just to be able to innovate to make sure this product can get to everywhere it needs. We partnered with Zipline to find ways to actually use their drones. They hadn't done it before for vaccines, so we worked for that technology and gave it to them to use for any manufacturer to be able to help uh, patients in needs in the most remote uh, villages. And then I think really the work that Pfizer did recently in announcing our accord for a healthier world. I mean, what a groundbreaking initiative to take all of our innovative patented medicines and provide them at a non-for-profit price to 45 lower income countries that covers up to 1.2 billion uh, people in the world. So this notion of scale and equity, not just during the pandemic, but for the uh, future is what really excites me and inspires yeah. me. It, it sounds like there's a number of those innovations that are really here to stay and will be a part of your even sort of non-emergent supply chain for Pfizer going forward. They will indeed. Uh, we'll embrace all of this going forward and ensure that the technology we built around mRNA, uh, the speed that we built, uh, the cold chain capability, use all of that for uh, future pandemics, if, if hopefully we never have one, but certainly for future innovations. As you talked about the scale of, of the manufacturing and distribution process, the partnerships like Zipline that you got creative with, uh, people has been a key theme, uh, much like your, your dad's heritage with the Apollo program. Tell me about how Pfizer's thinking about the future of work and the future of the workforce and how that plays into the supply chain. Yeah, this piece excites me so much. Again, I, to have an opportunity to see our colleagues like bring their best to work and be so innovative and be so passionate about serving patients, particularly in a pandemic, so it blew me away. Uh, so if I think about this workforce, how do, we, you know, how do we maintain that going forward? I mean, certainly there's a gap we know in US manufacturing uh, just across all industries. So we need to do our best to keep STEM education going to really ensure that we're educating the future workforce, expose them to our industry, which is really exciting. Like I had the opportunity as a summer intern while I was in university. It's the reason that I'm in pharmaceuticals today. Uh, so those things are really compelling. But I also think for me is embracing diversity, equity, and inclusion has been a critical part of our success because we know that when we bring people together from all walks of life, they actually produce better outcomes, right, than those are from similar uh, walks of life. So 
that has been extraordinary for, for me. And probably the most exciting example that we've had recently is our work we've done on our refugee leadership initiative. Uh, so this year we hired 100 refugees from Afghanistan, Syria, um, and those colleagues are now working in our manufacturing sites, making an enormous impact and filling a labor gap that we had, right? So critical jobs, they're highly educated, great opportunity to fill a gap for us and a great opportunity for them and their families. So it's been so successful, actually 100 uh, refugees this year. We've signed up for 500 more over the next uh, five years and something that I think will be our legacy uh, to come for many years to come. Well, congratulations, that sounds like a terrific initiative. Thank you. As you think about parents whose you know, daughters uh, are, are looking at the, the heroic role that medicine and doctors and, and drug makers uh, had during this pandemic, what would be you know, a piece of advice you'd give them? You talked about you know, the importance of STEM education and starting early for those you know, aspiring uh, chemists and, and formularies out there, what would you say? Yeah, as the father of five daughters, all in university today, I can tell you that we're really passionate about uh, them really immersing themselves and choosing the careers that they really love and enjoy. Uh, three of my daughters are studying uh, STEM uh, degrees, uh, and one in marketing, one in, uh, in history, and I'm excited for all of them because they will all make an impact on the world. And I think what we try and highlight with them is that their career paths are gonna be very different, that uh, the road won't be very clear, it won't be a straight path, uh, but if they have the confidence, if they work hard, if they embrace the great technology and the great diversity around them, they can make wonderful things happen in their careers. Well, that's inspiring and a, and a great thought. Uh, to close, I wanted to ask you, uh, if you had to pick one thing we could do as an industry or as a country to better prepare for the next pandemic, what would you single out? Yeah, we definitely signal out uh, partnerships. So partnership across industries, uh, partnerships across companies, uh, really the flexibility as well that's needed uh, within a pandemic. Uh, and then of course, lastly, we need a environment in the US where manufacturers like pharmaceutical manufacturers can uh, do their work uh, in an environment that is uh, effective, that is welcoming, uh, that uh, allows us to utilize our capital and hire and really make an impact and I think particularly we need uh, our country to be much more firmer on intellectual property. Uh, it's urgent that the work that we do, the innovations that we develop in the U.S. are not forced upon other countries uh, to, be, uh, to be given away. When the innovations were here in the U.S., the innovations are really making an impact on public health. And we don't want those jobs lost and that capital investment lost to another location. So IP protection would be one, I think, uh, incredibly important. But ultimately, with the right partnerships, uh, private industry and, and the public, we can really make an impact uh, going forward. Well, thank you. Um, I expect that IP protection is part of your agenda over on the Hill as you head towards an afternoon of meetings. But thank you for joining us. Uh, Mike McDermott, Chief Global Supply Officer for Pfizer. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you.